Now on BBC4, the legendary Dusty Springfield narrates a profile of the award-winning songwriter and one of tonight's Men of the Evening with This Is Now. Now I would like you to meet a man whom I love and admire. I've loved and admired him for a long time. But ever since we have been traveling together all over the world, I admire him even more. I can't love him very much more. He's my arranger, he's my accompanist, he's my conductor, and I wish I could say he's my composer, but that isn't true. He's everybody's composer. But, backward. I remember when uh, Mark, my mate Mark, he said, do you like Bert Bacher? I went, never heard of him. And I was about, I don't know, I don't know what, I was, you know, I was in my twenties, I went, never heard of him. They played me all these songs and I knew every single word to every one of them. You know, they'd all been there subconsciously, like, for years, you know. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. Not that he ever went away. He altered the course of pop music in the 60s, and now he's being rediscovered by a new generation for whom he is both icon and inspiration. I think a lot of people like Burt Bacharach because they think it's kitsch. And then there's a generation of songwriters who I think respect him immensely for just for what he's done, for the songs that he's written, you know. He's a big hero of mine, I suppose. A big songwriting hero. <laughs> The Look of Love, that was written for the film Casino Royale, and it gave me one of my biggest hits. I started composing pop songs the second act that I worked with. I thought, well, that's what I'll do. I quit this job. I was married for the first time. I'll come home, and I'll try to live a married life, and I went a year without ever getting a song recorded. And uh, that's hard. That's tough. Now and then I call your name And suddenly 
suddenly your face appears But it's just crazy Double penis mouth When it ends I started studying composing. I studied with Darius Milo in California. And I had written this one sonatina that summer for violin, oboe, and piano. And I was very ashamed, very kind of nervous and ashamed of the second movement because it was very melodic. And we were all writing very dissonant music in the class. And, and that was the Vogue at the time. And influenced by Henry Cowell and things like that. You know, that kind of fist fist to the piano, kind of prepared pianos and things like that. And so when I had this thing that really sang and was very melodic, I think that um, uh, I had a lot of reservations about it. And maybe he picked it up. I never said anything to, to Milo. But he um, probably felt and he said, Bert, you never ever feel embarrassed or discomforted by a melody that people can remember or whistle. And that really kind of like made a big impact on me. Really big impact. I had a big thing about being small. My dad was this great kind of athlete. That's what I aspired to be, like an athlete. I hated it. I mean, I just hated taking piano lessons. And I'm sure I did the early part because my mother wanted me to do it. So I heard one day Dizzy Gillespie and Thelonious Monk and Charlie Parker. And these people, this bebop era that was going on, so somebody had just like opened a window. I never heard any music like that. I never imagined any music like that. And whenever I could, I'd come in from Forest Hills where I was growing up, and I'd get a funny ID card to get into those clubs on 52nd Street. At the same time, I started hearing, somewhere in that one-year period, there was a piece by Ravel called Daphne and Chloe, the Daphne and Chloe Suite Two. And I thought that was marvelous. And some of the Debussy pieces and the uh, in French Impressionists. So I was getting it from two sources, or being influenced or being drawn towards music. Baby, it's you. Yet he was still unsure of the direction his life might take. After a stint in the army, he drifted into a career in music, working as an arranger and conductor for entertainers such as Vic Damone and Steve Lawrence. They say you never, never, never been true. Success as a songwriter soon took him away from live shows, although he did return for one very special performer, Marlene Dietrich. And I was very intimidated by Marlene first because she's very overpowered, very powerful presence. And um, then she got very dependent on me, and it became harder and harder because I started having all these hits all these R&B hits, so it's kind of a real paradox to be in Paris conducting the orchestra and go, see, si, what the boys, and at the same time having the Shrells having a number five record in the, in the States. Cause baby, it's you. She loved me. I loved Marlene. She said, nobody ever married, Bert. You shouldn't be ever married. Of course, I didn't pay any attention to what she had to say. <laughs> I didn't listen to her. <laughs> I think I've got a music box of maybe a half dozen or a dozen of uh, songs Bert and I have written together. Bert and I met at the famous music company, which was in the Rill Building, the Tin Pan Alley of New York City. Well, one day I perhaps suggested to Bert, or he may have suggested to me, that we try to write a song or two together. And that's how it began. 
Well, the Brill Building uh, was a very interesting part of the music business. Uh, there were 11 floors, and on each floor there were music publishers, small ones, big ones, medium-sized ones. And uh, in the offices, in the larger offices, such as Famous, where uh, Bert and I worked, uh, there were cubicles, uh, little rooms with a piano, upright pianos, and perhaps a desk, and uh, that's where you would come to work every day. I met Bert first. Uh, we were doing a background session. He had written a song with another songwriter, Bob Hilliard, called Mexican Divorce. And uh, the Drifters were recording it, and we, the girls, were doing the background for as a part of the background group with the Drifters. And uh, after the first rehearsal, uh, Bert approached me and asked if, uh, if I would do some demonstration records of songs that he was writing with a new songwriting partner called Hal David. And I said, you know, sure, as long as it didn't interfere with my education and my schooling. And my, and my mother said it was okay. And I signed with Bert and Hal as my producers. And they, in turn, signed their production company to Scepter Records. Well, I didn't know what we could really do with the end. I just knew she was wonderful to start with. That was a starter. And that she had some exceptional musicianship. Um, and as, as how David and I started to write for her, the more, we, the more we recorded, the more we wrote, the more we saw what she was capable of doing. Don't make me over. The first thing was Don't Make Me Over, which is a pretty difficult song. I think it's an octave and a sixth. That's a... Uh... Oh, it went for... Except that... So it went Don't Make Me Over, and the end. Except that for, for what I do... Except, so that's from there to there, which is that's an, it's two notes short of an oct uh, two octaves. It was almost as if I was taking an exam every time I sang one of Bacharach's melodies, basically because of the intervals, um, also time signatures. He had no regard whatsoever for time signature. If he was writing a song in 4-4 four, four time, which is common time, um, to throw a 7-8 bar in there and nothing to him. I mean, if that's the way he felt, that's what he wrote. We weren't trying to write yesterday's hit song. We wrote the songs that we kind of liked. And in the beginning, I, I think they sounded a little odd to some of the recording people. Sing how do you do? A um, little more length on the brass. A little more length. Just think of the lyric. What's new? But as you can. All right. Um, where are the two bars right before the strings come in? The end of the uh, last four bars of Arthur's theme. What bar is that? 120. Bar 120, please. I listen to authority figures, maybe a little bit more than I should have. Um, people that ran record companies, head of the A&R department. I do believe I sacrificed a couple of pretty good songs, maybe four, five, six that I can think of, because I'd hear things like, well, so-and-so said, it's really a terrific song, but you can't have a three-bar phrase. It's really got to be a four-bar phrase. So if you can make that a four-bar phrase, we'll give you so-and-so to record the song. So-and-so. And... -so. and I said, well, gee, they must be right. I must be wrong. A three-bar phrase is really probably unnatural. If they think, particularly if God thinks it's unnatural, I better please him because he's going to give me... And this song came out terrible. And that happened a number of times. And I think what I started to do, I know what I started to do, I started to make my own records. 
produce records, sort of like out of self-defense. Just what is it that gives a pop record that special something, that extra touch that makes it a hit and lifts it to the dizzy heights of the top of the top ten? Just what was it about these records, for instance? The look of love is in your eyes When there is always something there to remind me Look at me. Well, what all those hit records had in common was the composer, Bert Bachrach, the American who is currently holder of the title of the world's top pop composer. Somehow, Mr. Bachrach seems to have the golden key to pop success. Girl singers scramble to get their hands on his latest composition, convinced that if it says Bachrach on the label of their next record, they can just sit back and wait for it to hit the heights. to sing a song like that. Here at last was a writer who was dramatically changing the way pop music sounded. No wonder we all wanted to sing them. Anyone who ever loved could look at me and know that I love you. Anyone who ever dreamed could look at me and know I dream of you. Knowing I love you. The song was very, very, very chic, and I thought it needed to, to have that common touch or the commercial touch, as it were. And we got Johnny Pearson to arrange it and George Martin. My recording manager fiddled about with it. And hey presto, it was a number one. And Dion was dead choked, and she's never ever forgiven me to this day. I, I say frequently, and I truly mean it, that if in fact the organ had made a mistake, or if I had coughed during the, the, the middle of the song, Scylla would have coughed, and the organ player would have played a wrong note. That's how verbatim they copied exactly what was recorded. Um, Subsequently, I must say that uh, Walk On By was the next release, and uh, I dared her. <laughs> I literally dared, I dare you to, no. If you see me walking down the street, and I start to cry, please cry with me, do what? I think there was a, an osmosis that took place. Uh, Dion's voice was suddenly in my ear. I could hear her. I, so when uh, I, I wrote a lyric and, and, and the words that fell on certain accents uh, sounded like Dion sounded to my ear. I think Bert again, you know, probably sitting down in his piano and in his mind heard Dion in his ear as well uh, and, and, and she heard us Oh, 
with the Bacharach songs is that it's always when you lean towards voices that you, you, you sort of, you seem to, um, rather than a whole sound picture or, or the excitement of rhythm, that, that uh, his influence would be uh, useful, apart from anything else, as an example of how to go about solving a problem. Save time, let's do one without Johnny's cans. We'll, we'll get someone working on it. Right. Move it along a bit now. Right. I got this demo from Brian Epstein, my manager, and I listened to the song, and it was some fella singing Alfie. And I actually said to Brian, I can't do this. For a start, Alfie. I mean, you call your dog Alfie. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, you don't say. you can't. I can't sing a song, What's It All About, Alfie. You know, can't it be Tarquin or something like that? What's it all about, Alfie? Is it just for the moment we live? What's it all about when you thought it out, Alfie? But it was ever so difficult because the range in it was unbelievably hard so when I started the song in the soft voice it was awfully difficult to get all that energy up from really literally from my boots to really go for that high note it was hurting me I was hurting it's your feeling better out there mm -hmm. but I want to go on that all night though I'm hard on the singer I don't think she knew it hit her you must have gone 28 29 takes with her had it up early but I kept going can we get better than that can I get one more? There'll be a little bit more. A little bit more, a little better. Just some magic. Without true love, we can't exist. I'll be until you find the love you feel. You're nothing. Help me. When you certainly wouldn't have done it for a Quasimodo because it was Bert and he was gorgeous and so talented and I enjoyed his company anyway. When you see the picture of him, he's terribly handsome, you know, uh, he, he, you know, in pictures to this day. He, he, and, um, you know, he always seems to be wearing kind of a really, really cool sweater and white trousers. I could, if I wore white trousers for like, like two minutes, they would be disgusting. And a four, right, and a four, nobody coming on the downbeat, okay? Mm -hmm. Mr. B. I said, nobody come here on the dump. <laughs> Hello, baby. So I'll leave. Oh, still got these great legs. Oh, shit. <laughs> Just for you. Ladies and gentlemen of the orchestra, this Hello. is Dion Warwick, my sister. Your sister. Your sister. You can sing anytime you want, baby. Go right from that instrumental again, okay? You see this guy. This guy's in love with you Yes, I'm in love Who looks at you the way I do The beginning bit of This Guy's In Love With You goes down, 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 down. We, um, you know, on the on the world, it's uh, so we was, write, was writing this song and basically, well, what I done was I got, found out the chords, right? So. This guy's in love with you, which I must say took me nearly two and a half years to work out that song. And um, 
moved it up two keys, got all the chords, swapped them around, done it backwards, and then uh, put the world over the top. It sounds exactly the same. I'm surprised he's not sued me yet. It's called Half the World Away. I'm going to cover this guy's in love with you one day, though. Definitely. I think that's just that's possibly one of the, well, I would say the best love song ever. Backrack songs are, are very um, simple but complicated at the same time. Uh, the structure is uh, seems very basic, but when you start looking at the chords and how he moves them, it, he has his own little way of his own little design that's uh, it's specifically his. Uh, and for some strange reason, you know, a lot of those songs are not really flexible uh, for a lot of other artists to to uh, perform because. Yeah, the melodies and the, and the chords kind of link up in a certain way, and you have to be at a particular place at a particular time. 237. 237. One, two, one, and. Are you breathing? Breathing right before then? Are you taking a breath? It sounds like you play like you got a long phrase. Okay, so it's like a longer scope to it. Okay, let's go. Same place. 237. Two, one, and. Oh, it's <laughs> applause, and right underneath the applause, we go one, two, one, two, three, next song. I think the arrangement tends to be overlooked uh, by a number of people in a number of instances. But to me, you can have a terrific song and a terrific singer, but if the arrangement somehow doesn't fit that particular song and singer, well, it's not going to make for the definitive version. Maybe what happens a lot of my songs, they have come, they've been born with the surround around them. And not only is the song there, not only the melodic flow, the rhythmic flow, there are orchestra colors. It's what the drums might be playing. It's where the drums come in. It's what the bass might be playing. They seem to kind of be carried along. Not fully. I think when the song is written and you know what you have, then you go back and then, then all the extra stuff gets kind of put into the mix. Close to You is one of the few exceptions where I believe Bert wasn't exactly on his game as far as the, uh, the arrangement being up to the, the potential of the song. And it, it thankfully he wasn't <laughs> because it worked out so beautifully, uh, uh for Karen and me. Close to You launched the Carpenter's career. Herbie approached me. He gave me a lead sheet. And he said, I want you to do your own arrangement of this with the exception of one thing. He said, at the end of the first bridge, there are two five-note uh, uh, groupings. Uh, turned out to be in the key we did. It would be... And he thought that that had a, a particular hook to it. And he said, if you just keep that in mind and then do whatever else you want with it, which I did. And I took it into uh, the sound stage and came up with the, uh, uh, well, what's a slow shuffle? And then we added the 
the vibraphone right there. And then Karen by herself in tempo. Why do? See, right there is classic back rack. Yep, that is it. Why do stars fall down from the sky every time you walk by? Just like me, they long to be close to you. On the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to create a dream. Nineteen seventy was a good year for Bert. The theme song from the film Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid followed close to you to the top of the charts. The film score also won two Oscars. Just very glad to get it, really. Hell, right? Yeah. And he'd scored a success with his first Broadway musical. Breakthrough in in musical writing for for the Broadway theater. A unique horizon, you know, different rhythms, different kinds of melodies. Backrack is the first new original American composer since Gershwin. My acting doesn't really change the world, but I think that Bert's music does. But after the successes of 1970, it was to be more than 10 years before he had a new song get to number one. Bert was soon to split not only from his wife, Angie Dickinson, but from his two closest musical collaborators. We had a great run. We wrote a ton of songs, a ton of material. We had a lot of success together. And we stayed existent as a team until it was like um, time to everybody move on. It's sort of like a marriage. They decided that they wanted nothing more to do with each other in the capacity of writing anyway. Um, and because I was obliged to give Warners a certain amount of albums um, and produced by Backrack David, there became a conflict, basically. There were two people that weren't speaking to each other. So you couldn't expect them to write with each other. And, I mean, it's just logic. And unfortunately, because of the problem, I would have been sued by Warners if I had not sued Backrack David. And that's the story, folks. <laughs> I wrote something for the Houston Symphony. Um, it wasn't necessarily successful, but it was, uh, it was something I was very exciting to do. It wasn't successful at all. Very expensive, failure. What happened was that it was all live, everybody playing at the same time. If there was a mistake, that was it. You were straddled with it. I dreamt about that. I dreamt about that whole process for two months afterwards. Every night it was the same dream. I've never had anything like that. Once about a lady, I dreamt every night for two, two weeks. But, um, but an album, interesting. Always the same, always the panic, always the fear. I wasn't gonna get it done. The time was running out. 
it goes somewhere and they go, hey, Bert, don't you write anymore? Or what are you writing? Or uh, how come we don't hear any songs of yours anymore? And, you know, to me, the the absurdity of it was that here was this man who, who you know, whose contribution to music was phenomenal, you know, and who, if he never wrote another song after Alfie and Do You Know This Way to San Jose and What the World Needs Now is Love and House Is Not a Home and Message to Michael and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, had already done it. guest host on a talk show for the week and I was one of the guests on the talk show I went on to sing a song and and after the show uh, he said uh, would you like to have dinner with me one night and would you like to write a song with me one day and I have to this day never really figured out which he said first because I think that would be a key as to what happened with our marriage but I, n- I never did figure out well did he ask me to dinner first or did he ask me to write a song first I think any time you work with somebody, I mean, this is a general observation. It's not even necessarily about me and Carol. But when you do work with somebody uh, and you're married to them, it puts a, a severe degree of difficulty. You're in a recording studio all day, and then you come home. And uh, I'm not saying that that's how it was, but I'm not saying it wasn't that way either. I think it's very tough. I think it's tough just, I think it's just tough being in a relationship being married, uh, without having um, that kind of uh, strain. You know, you be in the studio with someone you're married to, and instead of arguing about something that's a real personal thing, you say, well, no, the drums should be playing a backbeat with a snare, not the cross stick. No. <laughs> you know, it can, be, it can be things like that. In the beginning of That's What Friends Are For, you know, it started, bum bum, da 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 da. So I wrote, I never thought I'd feel this way. And he goes, no, no, it's da-dum, da-da-da-da. I go, so what's the difference? You know, I'm just, just get rid of the da-dum and go into, I never thought I'd feel this way. No, got to have the bum-bum. So I got so, you know, pissed off because it's like, well, it's just, ba- it's, just a, it's just a little eighth note, you know, a sixteenth note. What does that matter? But, you know, I think that's part of his brilliance is that those sixteenth notes, that, You know, that thing that most of the people I've ever written with would just say, fine, you know. He was so precise about, and so it was so important to him. And he could sit in in the music room and and, and spend an hour on whether he did or didn't like the 16th note, which I might add, if you are the lyricist, could be rather maddening because you're now drawing many pictures and writing your name in different uh, forms and colors. and But... You know, he was right, and finally I, I wrote, And I never thought I'd feel this way. And that's why the song starts with the word and. And I never thought I'd feel this way. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad I got the chance to say that I do believe I love you and did. I should ever go away Love is exposure, eyes and try To feel the way we do today And then if you can remember Keep smiling, keep 
keep shining Though you can always count on me For sure That's what friends are for Written for the film Night Shift, Friends was later released as a single to raise money for AIDS research. It went on to win a Grammy and publicly reunited Dion and Bert after more than a decade apart. That's what friends are for! When I met Carol, maybe I wasn't writing music that was so accessible at that time, but meeting Carol, she has a very good sense of a positive direction to go, and she put the blinkers on the horse. Can't write for me, but I, I feel like I'm writing much better now <laughs> being with Carol, so... Come to daddy. Ready? Whoa, man. Oh, I thought you had your, your foot stuck in the stirrup. Say bye-bye, George. Bye-bye, George. I'm going to pat the neck now. Say okay. bye-bye. Pat him right there. Pat him on the neck. Just a little patty. Give right. Patty five. All right. Cool. See you later. All right. Okay. When I got involved with racing, it was the one thing that took my mind away from the writing, the recording. Now you got it. Okay. I'm here. Right. Whoa! Listen, Dick's not around. I'm gonna go sneak ZG a carrot, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, yeah. Dick's... There's a lot of stuff that is so different than um, in my profession. In my profession, everything's kind of like. It's a smash hit. Bafo business. It's a smash. The record's going to number one. Here, everything's kind of understated. I wouldn't call him an easy owner because he's so emotional. You can tell, like he said, he can tell in, in the sound of my voice what, what our day with the horses was like. I can tell in his voice the disappointment, up and down or excitement, which way it went. He's in a good position, right? Yeah. You didn't have any trouble getting over. So you replace one obsession with another obsession. <laughs> See, and that's always been like Start. Decades after the success of Promises, Promises, Bert is again exploring the possibilities of a stage musical. Bert's music has always turned me on, not just because of those ravishing tunes, but because of the extraordinary time changes and the fact that he never sticks in a given rhythm for long. Just as you think, oh, I see where this song is, yes, I see it goes woof off in another direction. And to me, that's very exciting in the theatre because when people think they know where they are, suddenly that's not where they are at all. <laughs> It is urban and it is shimmering and glamorous and yet there's an enormous yearning quality, the great sad soul coming out of it. Besides all the sexy things that we know like the look of love which my generation certainly is all made love to many a time I'm certain. <laughs> and um, I hope to get this peculiarly searching yearning quality in Bert's music really to come out strongly in the form of a musical. You know, I've written with a whole bunch of writers in this last two, three years period. I like writing with different people now. This is like, I don't know, maybe it's like dating in the field. You know? Not being married to anybody, being like right with you, or right with you. that's kind of appealing to me now. I was approached to write a song for a film called Grace of My Heart, a, a, a drama directed by, uh, written and directed by Alison Anders. Um, and it's about a, 
a Brill Building songwriter and about her career. And of course, in the story, they need these songs to appear, which are credibly hits of their time. Um, so they've employed a number of different writers to ghostwrite the songs that the character apparently writes in the story. And I had already written one song, and they came to me and said, would I like to write uh, what I believe would be one of the pivotal romantic ballads of the film? And would I write it with Burt Bacharach? So it hmm, took a really long time to decide that, you know. We decided to try and write the song um, long distance. And so I wrote... Um, the opening of the song and probably one of the more nerve-wracking things I've ever had to do was um, play the tape of my little demo done in my studio at home uh, down the phone into his answer machine because I, I thought I could talk him through it but on the day I called up he wasn't home. I, might still break I got an encouraging call back and a little while later I got uh, facts of some more music and then him playing into my answer machine the, the um, the bridge of the song, and so it developed. That song is sung the more I worked with him, and the more I thought about some of the other songs of his that I admired, the more I realized that he's probably one of the rare composers of pop music that have a language of their own, that they, they, they favor certain harmonies and certain intervals heavily, and certain kind of voicings, and you realize that these things are, belong to them. They've, they've become their style. It's Bert. I say, he is unique, not only as a, uh, a melody writer, but as an arranger. He'd come up with these little arrangemental hooks uh, in his records that were every bit to me as important as the melody itself, actually seem like the melody itself. When you hear covers of certain tunes, no matter how differently they're done, those little hooks remain. It's hard writing music. It always, it always was. <laughs> it is now, and always will be. Hard for me. We are two captives of the heart. Captives of the heart. Captives of the heart. It's hot. <laughs> it's exciting. Feel it. Now, when you say that I worked hard for my money, you worked very hard for your money. It's hot out there. Now, do you all want to photograph me? I'll be in the shower. <laughs> Come